We're going to take you back in history a little bit here on the South Africa uh, tonight. I'm Gareth Edwards, by the way. This week we might see Child Killer. It's a name you might remember if you're a little bit older. Norman Afzal Simons uh, walking free. Now, many people, even younger, will know the nickname that he was given. The Station Strangler, believed to have been responsible for uh, the murders uh, between 1986 and 1994 of at least 22 children. Uh, Mitchell's Plain residents expressing concerns over his potential release back in the day, uh, living in absolute terror, I'm sure. While making time for me this evening, uh, forensic and investigative psychologist, uh, Professor Gerard Labaskagni, uh, coming in uh, to make time and join us uh, this evening as well. Prof, good evening to you. Normally talking to you over Zoom, so yep. it's nice to uh, have you in person with us uh, as well. I want to get a sense, though, when you look at someone who has caused the kind of devastation, the terror uh, that's, that Norman Afzal Simons did back in the day. Can someone ever be rehabilitated? I'm going from a negative standpoint, but it's, it's quite a rap sheet. Well, I think this is where I, I differ a lot from what's the public narrative. Mm. Norman Simons was only charged with one murder. Mm. He was convicted of one murder. He was never charged with any of the other ones. So it's actually incorrect to call him a serial murderer because he's only had one conviction. The magistrate who did the subsequent autop um, um, inquests on the other cases didn't instruct that he should be charged with the others. You know, um, the DNA that was found didn't match Norman Simons. So, you know, this is, it's become, whenever you say his name, people say the station strangler. It's like synonymous. Mm -hmm. But it's actually incorrect to call him a station strangler. Um, so my personal opinion, he's convicted on one murder. He served 28 years. That's far longer than the majority of other uh, single child murder uh, suspects have sat and served for because there's this label of station strangler of hanging over his head. So quite honest, if he's, if he's been well behaved in prison, he's done whatever they wanted him to, and every other child murderer would have been released by now, then he should be released. So the second question is, should serial murderers be released? And I don't think they ever should be released. Mm. But there's a big dispute, honestly, whether actually he is responsible for those other 22 murders. But he's become understood in the public narrative as the station strangler. So it, you could almost blame the media, and let's be honest about this, you could blame the media for the hype uh, around this, because we all love our very, very fancy mm. headlines, and once it's attached to someone uh, as well, then they, it's very difficult to get rid of yeah. that stigma. What does that do for the public psyche, even knowing, as you say, convicted of only one murder, found guilty of only one murder, because of that stigma, mm. because of that hype, I feel like there's a better yeah. word than hype, help me with that one, uh, around him, that there's a, a, an element of fear uh, mm. in, involved here as well. So where does the court and where does society begins to handle him, knowing one murder convicted for, but there's this hype around him. There's got to be a lot of fear here. Mm. No, understandably. I mean, like I said, he, he has become the station strangler. If you ask people who is a station strangler, they'll say Norman Simons. They'll say, what did he do? He killed 22, 23 kids. Mm. He's been convicted on one, never charged mm. with any other ones. So. I don't know how that's going to be undone. Uh, I definitely, I can guarantee you, he was seen for parole purposes as being the station strangler. That's why he sat so long. Um, so I, I don't know how one undoes that. Uh, how, I, do I, you, how do you analyze him psychologically, even though it might only be mm. one? I know this sounds terrible to say, but one versus the accusation of 22. But one is too much mm. to even kill a child. Yeah, one absolutely. would suggest there's something very wrong here. As a psychologist, where do you begin to, to try and pick that apart? I mean, that's obviously difficult. Um, one offender, I mean, could he have admitted more if he hadn't been arrested? I, I don't know, but that's mm. a problem. We can over-speculate, mm. and then we implant that upon him and make our judgment, or the parole board makes their judgment, and that's, again, unfair. We have to decide, are we going to go with the facts, or are we going to go with our emotions? Mm. If we go with emotions, then it's a free-for-all. Then we can decide we don't like this particular person, so he should just stay in forever. Mm. And then we don't care about this particular suspect who might have done exactly the same thing. We don't care if he yeah, goes. There out. might be hundreds of others. There are the no others of people who've killed single child uh, uh, um, uh, victims yeah. who've been released and not a boo or a bar by from society. So, again, I think we should have a fair, open, transparent process by which we judge offenders and take the emotion out of it as far as possible in terms of the people who have to make that decision. Of course, the family is going to be emotional. That's understandable. And they get the opportunity to give their viewpoints at a parole hearing. Mm -hmm. But if Do we, we start... have a process like that currently <laughs> to your mind? Well, if you want to get into parole, as I said, every time I open my mouth, correctional services hates me even more. Our parole process, and I've got to try not to use an offensive word, is an absolute disaster. How we assess offenders, 
how we make those decisions. We have parole boards who will just go against the psychologist's recommendations that someone shouldn't be released, and they'll release them. Mm. Um, so the parole process is an absolute disaster on its own in terms, as a general rule. I'm not saying every single hearing is a disaster, but as a general rule, the ones that I've sat in and participated in, like the Lee, Donovan Moodley parole hearing regarding Lee Matthews, that's, it's, it's shocking, the so process. they actually hear what you're saying? No, they don't, listen, no, so they don't listen to it. So, so for example, when the Lee Matthews example, I, mm. I was asked to assist the family to write a report. The parole board said, no, they don't want to hear anybody's reports. They don't want my report. They don't want a report by friends of pathologists who, who submitted a follow-up report on his most recent version of events that is not actually medically possibly true. They said, no, we don't want to hear those. Those will undermine correctional services' own psychologists' reports. <laughs> Um, and then basically only th what happens there is that the Matthews family, just whatever comes out of their mouths, their questions that they want to put to Moodley, etc., is all that, that, get, that gets taken into account. So you have this absolute block on any outside information. But then in other cases, like the, the Krugersdorp sword um, killer, Mornay Samurai Hamza, killer. I was actually requested by Correctional Services, Zornavartha, to be an independent third party in addition to their own two psychologists. And all three of us were saying there's no way you should release this guy, and they release him. So I, I don't understand how these parole boards work. Each one that I've been involved in seems to have its own rules that it makes up as mm. things go by. And that really needs to be rehauled from start to finish. So to the back of what you've just said, I would be, if I had to put my mind oh, and, my, and myself in the shoes of the Mitchell's Plain residents right now, based on what you just said, it's not going to fill me with great confidence. There's experts like you and perhaps others, I'm sure involved in this over the years, that are saying, don't do this, even though it's only, I've got to be careful how I say it, it's not only one child murder, but the one child murder, not mm. 22 per se. If, there, if you don't even trust, and the community can't even trust the correctional services board to make a correct call, you can't blame the community for being furious about this. Yeah. So I think in this particular instance of Norman Simons, you've got, as I said, as we discussed, this whole label, then people's minds, he is the station strangler. He has killed 22 or more people. Of course, I'd be outraged if you're going to release that person into society. It could society. be your neighbor. Um, then we've got the problems that I have really huge doubts about the majority of pro boards, their ability to do proper assessments and have proper factual hearing about these offenders. So I think you've got two, two, two issues here. Yeah. But like I said, you know, I have my concerns as to whether we can really call, um, uh, well, we can't factually call Norman Simons a station strangler. He was only charged and convicted of one. And in fact, the prosecutor of that case in a documentary actually said he couldn't even believe that they got a conviction because the evidence was incredibly shaky and they were very surprised. And I think the court, consciously or unconsciously, could never have delivered a not guilty verdict in that case. There was already riots taking place around that time when Simons was initially arrested. About in the process of the investigation, the community was uproared. Then imagine that judge delivering a not guilty verdict. Mm. Now, I'm not saying intentionally that he did that knowing Simons is guilty. But courts but do take into the, the social construct, the social pressures around them, the community interest. They do take that in. We've heard yeah. that. Well, directly, indirectly, unconsciously, consciously, Absolutely. whichever term you want to use, that would have been weighing heavily upon that particular judge. To, to, that if he had to deliver a not guilty verdict, there would have been an absolute riot taking place in Mitchell's plane. How do you then begin, you see, now we've got to be careful how we use professor. Now we've got to be careful how we use the word rehabilitated. Because if we're going off of potentially not having even done this, at very least one child murder, not a serial killer, as, mm. as he's been known, the uh, station strangler. How does a person either begin to show that they have been re re rehabilitated? How do you as a professor, as a psychologist, prove this person has been re rehabilitated? And three, how do you as an expert even begin to understand if a person needs mm. rehabilitation? Because if you're going on the sentiment, it's the station strangler, 22 murders, it's a very different person Absolutely. to one person who committed maybe mm. one murder. Mm. Again, not to be flippant, but one versus 22 yep, is a big, a big difference. difference. Absolutely. The risk profile is massively different. So I think it should start with a proper risk assessment when the person arrives at correctional services doing an evidence-based risk assessment. What risk factors which we know are associated with violence, which we know are associated with sexual violence, because this was a sexual murder, what, is the, what are those, based on the research, does he have? Which of those can we fix? Which of those can we not fix? Mm. And over the period of time, up until parole, he should be undergoing a process of, with psychologists, going under, undergoing various programs that exist that address those changeable risk factors. And at the end of it, we look at, have we dealt with those successfully, which means we've lowered the risk of this person reoffending again. And of course, then they do look at his behavior uh, during, in, while he's in prison, 
Has he got involved in gang activities, been, had internal offences, etc.? But if you don't know by any chance. No, I, I mean, they might, okay. they might not, I don't know. Okay. And of course, then, you know, then we get to the parole process and we then reflect back upon what he's done over these years. Of course, when it comes to child sexual offences, it's difficult because, you know, if we're talking about someone who uh, regularly assaults people and, and gets into fights, kills people, well, they would probably display that to some degree in the prison context. Because you're surrounded by adults. You, you're, you're surrounded, surrounded by, by adults. Children. You're, you're victim, target victimology. Of course, when you're dealing with people like pedophiles or ch someone who's once off child murder, they're not surrounded by those victims. Right. The trigger and, is gone. And the prison is a very contained environment. Mm -hmm. You're not exposed to the... It's like, even with normal serial murderers who are killing, for example, adult females, they're typically very well behaved in prison. But you're also not exposed to your victimology. You're not exposed to the life stressors that often might be the trigger for your offending behavior. So, so when we look at serial murderers in general, their prison behavior is not a really good way to judge whether they, they'd be rehabilitated. Because even outside, they weren't living a life of crime. They were living a very normal life. Mm. They were having jobs, having relationships, some you know, married with children, et cetera, et cetera. Not robbing, stealing, lying, cheating. Mm. So their outside behavior barring their murders, was very normal. So how can we then say, well, when they're in prison, oh, they're behaving so normal. Yeah, they behave normal outside too, except, for example, the individual cases of murder. So typically with your normal serial murderers, they are very well behaved in prison, but that's no indication that they, are being, they have been rehabilitated. But unfortunately, correctional services seems to put a lot of weight on how did you behave since you got here? And if you've been good, you haven't got into any trouble, you've done whatever programs that exist, uh, you know, uh, sex offenders program, um, uh, anger management program. But it's like being sent to the principal's office. Everyone exactly. behaves when yeah. you get sent to the principal's office. So, th you know, you, you typically are very well behaved. You, sit, you just have to not fall asleep in those programs and they get ticked off. Is that really a good way to judge whether someone actually has been rehabilitated. Mornay Haramsa did nothing. The, more, the, the Krugersdorp sword killer, for example, did nothing for the first nine years of his, of his incarceration. Mm. And then quickly before parole, he starts doing a few courses. So I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a very concerning process that starts off when that prisoner arrives in the actual prison. They don't receive a copy of the case file from the police. They don't receive the court judgment. They arrive in prison and all correctional services literally knows about them in 90% of the cases is you have one times murder conviction and your sentence is 25 years. So what you've actually done might not even be aware to correctional services. How do you start to plan a rehabilitation program for someone? So, just very briefly, Prof, uh, you and I could talk all night. I've, I find this fascinating. I'm sure you do as well. I really could talk all night about this, but I need to say goodbye to you. So, if I was the community of Mitchell's play, never mind the parents of the victims, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine, but really the anger, yes, of course, aimed at Norman Simons, but really the anger from what I'm getting here should actually be aimed at correctional service as well, because there's process failures. Here now, as well. I mean, I can't say I haven't been privy to the Norman Simon's parole hearing. It might have been done very well. It might have been done very comprehensively. I don't specifically know in this case. Yeah. So my criticism of the parole process is my experiences in general with how these things go down. Um, it doesn't give me great faith to think that any of them are going to go well. But I cannot say that his parole process wasn't effectively and very responsibly done because I was not involved in that sure. particular process or have any fantastic insight into his, his particular parole process. But in your experience, it generally doesn't go well mm -hmm. in this case as well. Prof, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, as I was saying, the Prof and I really could uh, talk all night about this, especially when it comes to whether it's 22 murders uh, or one murder of a child or any other crime. You can imagine how traumatizing it is for the family as well. But a huge thank you to Professor uh, Gerald Labuskakhni making time this evening, uh, psychologist Professor uh, Gerald Labuskakhni joining us uh, this evening, getting into the mind of a serial killer, but also, I suppose, not even the mind of a serial killer. Yes, that's a different discussion. But what we were trying to figure out is uh, where does correctional services sit on this? Because they're the ones who make these assessments. They're the ones who make these decisions in the end as well.